but um, okay, I guess all right. it's all right. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, well, I, I remember meeting, uh, so to speak, you first a, a number of years ago with the first MOOC that you and, and Siemens did. Right. And I was fascinated for that. Was what, 2008? Yes, it was, yeah. Ah, that was I know it. Eh? <laughs> that was beautiful. I was so inspired by it, actually, in very many ways that uh, I then implemented in my own courses. I mean, not books, I mean, regular sure, yeah. playing courses. So, well, I, I, we just came out of a, of a panel on AI, which you participated in. I, I was going to ask, but I, I could not. You guys, what? Uh, why are we talking a lot about uh, explanations? Because explanations are not typically given by neural systems, but AI has a, a symbolic uh, value that can provide easily uh, explanation. For instance, Watson is a uh, uh, well, well, so. well, oh, I think that bumped. <laughs> oh my! Okay. So what were you we saying about explanations? Yeah. Okay. And symbolic AI. Yeah. Well, symbolic AI is really a thing of the past. Um, it proved not to be sufficient to the task, and all of the major AI systems today are using neural networks. So that's why they need massive amounts of data, okay. right? And so they're working with you know 50,000 parameters, and that's why an explanation is so hard, right? How do you take 50,000 parameters and produce a nice simple sentence? And so part of what I said today is, part of our problem is we're looking for a nice simple sentence to explain something that is actually really very complex. And so we have to understand, whatever we get, we're not gonna get a complete explanation we're gonna get an explanation from a very narrow point of view. And so the trick is going to be, how do you narrow down that point of view? How do you find the relevant alternatives to whatever it was you were looking for to explain? Yes, indeed, and, and also, yeah, I like your example about GPT-3. I mean, I don't see why, perhaps in, a, in the future, uh, I, the, the system itself cannot generate its own explanation. That, that would be a sort of uh, yeah. awareness, something like that. Maybe it can, but the question is, could we believe the explanation? <laughs> but yes, but at that point, can we believe ourselves in the, with all the number of mistakes that we sure. do every day? Ultimately, yeah. it comes down to the same logic. That's why the other panelists were saying something along, along yes. the lines of, we need to be able to validate the, the models and algorithms that these systems are using. And if we can validate the model or the algorithm, run it against known tests, for yes. example, mm -hmm. then we can trust the algorithm, yeah, we can exactly. trust the system. Yeah. So there would be that two-step process, validate the system and then use that validated system to produce the explanation. Yes, but we still would run some sort of risk. Uh, in, in any case, that, yeah. that goes without saying. Yeah, but I mean, compared, you know, I think I think you kind of hit it on the hit it on the head there. Compared to the explanations we get from people today, you know, sometimes they're they're pretty questionable, anyway. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes. And 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 then we come to the to another point. I mean, uh, yes, I understand the problem of mass evaluation of mass. So this and that. But, um, for instance, I was watching a, a, a talk this morning about a robot uh, that uh, helps in teaching, and I couldn't yeah. help myself think, look, wouldn't uh, an assistant student be much better than a robot in this case? I mean, perhaps a robot would be good at some point doing some kind well, of... If you were watching the same robots that I was watching, yeah, the student would be much better. <laughs> they, they were very simple rule-based yeah, systems. Yeah, indeed, was I, was, I was sad. amazed, yes. But in, even if they were a, li a little or a lot better, mm -hmm. still there's the point. Why are we obsessed with machines 
when humans can do this job really well? Well, and the answer is very simple. I think and the machine will do it for one tenth, one one hundredth of the cost, and also faster. Uh, and that's why we've always used machines, any kind of machine. Why do we use like a bulldozer when a man with a shovel could do the same thing? Well, it's going to take the man with a shovel ten years to do what a bulldozer can do in an afternoon. That's why. That's true, in a, in a fraction of the cost. But still, yeah. we talk a lot about assisting teachers mm -hmm. while we don't give teachers enough tools, enough money, enough power to do their sure. job. Yeah. And we don't talk about uh, the workers who need to clean the windows, for instance, yeah. and place robots in there. Well, and this is the other thing, I think, again, a valid point. And this is the other thing that, that people aren't so inclined to raise when they talk about, you know, not just artificial intelligence, but automation generally. And that is, um, how are we going to organize the distribution of wealth produced by these systems? Because if we're using the same economic model that we're using today, um, then it's going to be very difficult to, to pay people, right? Uh, because they can produce a year's worth of work in an afternoon. And you're only paying them for the afternoon. Right? So there has to be some connection between the wages a person gets and their productivity, even if that productivity is augmented by a machine. Some kind of proportionality there. Uh, other, you know, because, yeah, I mean, we don't talk about the people who wash the windows. We don't talk about you know, the people around us here who are preparing this beautiful room. Right? They're probably not making very much money. But all of this, this entire room and the elevator we took is made possible by machines. And I'm sure the owners of this beautiful hotel are making a lot of money, much more money than the people working at it, right? So, you know, when we come down to a question of why the AI instead of a person, right now it's always because the AI is cheaper. But we need to balance that a bit, right? We need to have ways of paying people to use AIs to be more productive and paying them in a way that represents their actual contribution. Some equity. Yeah. Some equity, yeah. That's a good, a good and I, point. I think that's a really important point, personally. That's a very, very important point. I agree. Listen, uh, um, on the same line, uh, there is this movement with these new technologies and uh, they have been labeled in many ways, the metaverse in one of them. Mm -hmm. These, these ways and from one point on one hand we have this metaverse thing right. and on the other for instance the reason why I was here to do my workshop is was to sell in a way the open web in the sense right, that right. going back to the 90s yeah. why isn't that pushed a little bit more so we have two worlds yeah. and what, what do you think about the two which, which one could there be some bullshit in the in the part of my French in uh, in uh, in the metaverse? Well, of course, there, of course there is. Um, yeah, there, there's a bunch of things happening going on right now all together. Um, so, one aspect of the metaverse is virtual reality, right? And we we see some proprietary systems. We see. For example, the Unreal Engine or Unity, right, uh, which produce wonderful AI or uh, wonderful virtual yeah. reality. Um, there's also a Mozilla virtual reality engine. People don't really yeah. talk about that very much, right? Um, but that's just one aspect of the metaverse. And what the commercial entities need to do is produce what they call lock-in, right, to make it useful to use their virtual reality rather than Mozilla's virtual reality because the technology is just about to the point where yeah it could be open it could be produced as open source it could be widely shared that creates a risk for companies that already have a business model based on this so the metaverse we need to understand what the metaverse is it's not just augmented reality. Uh, it's not just virtual reality. It's all of these things. 
but it also incorporates what we call persistence. Persistent objects through the system, right? Uh, for example, a persistent identity for a person going from one meta or one virtual reality system to another to another. It's always the same person. You need that if you're going to do something like commerce in virtual reality. And uh, I, I read something the other day about uh, Amazon's Alexa costing billions of dollars, right? Losing billions of dollars for the company. And the reason for that is they expected people to use Alexa to do their shopping. But nobody used Alexa to do their shopping. So they're losing money on it. And that's the risk that people with VR systems face. So you want to connect the person tightly to the system. Amazon would like to do that as well, right? Um, so you need persistent objects. You need persistent people. You need persistent things. You know, you want to create an economy of VR objects already when you go into these systems, right? Uh, you get an Unreal Engine or even the Mozilla Engine. You can buy pre-made worlds, right? Uh, but there needs to be persistence to that. Uh, first of all, for provenance, so that you don't just take the pre-made world and sell it to someone else but also for uh, combination and organization of those worlds. So that's what the metaverse is. It's the commercial proposition added to the top of VR and AR. And they're not gonna talk about that part. They're gonna talk about the gee whiz VR part, but that's been around for ages. Yeah. You know, but what's new is the persistence. So and that, that persistence is perhaps what uh, educational institution might want to dig into. Oh, I'm sure they would. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, you know, and again, I've, I've worked with systems uh, for uh, companies and for government agencies that use these for training, and they'd like to track the same person from one instance of VR to another instance of VR to another instance of VR. So that's why systems like XAPI exist. XAPI is a system that allows these uh, environments to register the activities in what they call a learning record store, an LRS. And there are companies out there that produce these now. So the LRS connects all of these different training experiences together and it's able to create a training profile for the person. Mm. That sounds interesting. And you think so? Do you think that education there will be uh, an interesting future for that? Yeah, it'll be niche, right? You don't want to do everything in VR. That would be sure. crazy, right? <laughs> uh, you know, lots of things you can do in person. There's lots of things you can do just working from home. But some things really benefit from VR. You know, uh, training to do an operation, tra uh, training to fly an aircraft, uh, training to drive a bulldozer just to give it full circle there, right? And, and what about Second Life and those first attempts? Well, this is the thing that, like, they didn't have any persistence inside the environment, right? So, yeah, basically, what happened in Second Life stayed in Second Life, right? And, uh, you know, back when I was in the world of MUDs, multi-user dungeons, online games, we used to say, Something is real if it has an effect outside that environment. So if something happened in a mud and then you carried it with you through your daily life, then whatever happened in the mud was real. And that's what the metaverse requires. It needs that connection to the external world through persistent objects. So, and... Um well, just a, a last question on, on this next development. So mm -hmm. We're talking a lot about blockchain. Blockchain being a, a background technology, sure, yeah. if you will, you know, something that should stay transparent to the user. Mm -hmm. So why are we talking so much about that? And uh, apart from uh, securing that a ledger yeah. is what it represents, what other uses yeah. uh, you, you foresee? So blockchains are basically made up of what are called Merkle chains. A Merkle chain is a directed acyclic network. 
That's really interesting because you can use that for version control. You can move from thing to thing to thing and basically you take one version, you connect it to another version, but by being directed and acyclic, it's always moving forward, always moving forward. So it's, it's locked into the sequence in which something was created. So you've done two things with that. First, you've established provenance, which means the original ownership of something. And, and second, you've created a mechanism that allows large groups of people to collaborate on a single collection of things. Now, the first group of people who did this was the financial sector. And of course, it being the financial sector, they were crooked like crazy, <laughs> right? Um, but outside the financial sector, there were a lot of really solid uses for this kind of technology. A good example is GitHub. GitHub is version control for software code. It uses pretty much the same technology. There are differences, obviously, but pretty much the same technology. GitHub is a directed acyclic network, or directed acyclic graph, more accurately. Wow, that's very interesting. Yeah, I never, never thought about it that way. No, because the financial sector gets all the headlines, right? Because people, for some reason, think, oh yeah, the people in the financial sectors are geniuses. But they're not. They're just high-stakes gamblers. <laughs> yes. Well, what, what would you like to, to, to say to, to instructors, faculty, doing research or not, in their own subject? What, what sort of message, if any, would you say about technology, about education, technology, etc. First thing I'd say is share, right? Share your knowledge, share your experience, um, you know, share the value that you've created. Don't worry about making money. Right? Uh, the money will come, right? The first and most important thing is to share, because by sharing, you're getting connected with other people who are interested in the same thing that you are. Other people, not just where you live, not just in your city, but around the world, right? And so if you share, you're contributing toward an open network, uh, and you're creating value, and that value will eventually, it takes time, come back to you. Come back to you. That's a very powerful message. Well, thank you, Stephen, very much. You're welcome. I enjoyed it very much. I hope the video I hope it came too. up, <laughs> comes up yeah. with a decent quality. Yeah, but well, we'll see. <laughs> thanks a lot. You're welcome. Really.